Welcome everyone to the WCG Avoca and Medible webinar on quality through innovation focused on building protocols with decentralized clinical trial elements to improve study success. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Lisa McKay and I'm head of member services with the Avoca Quality Consortium. In today's webinar, which will be presented by Chrissy McDonald of WCG Avoca and Andrew McKinnon of Medible, Avoca will share some key findings from its research on the state of the industry report on innovation challenges and opportunities, and Medible will share some real-life case studies that focus on improvements in quality derived from leaving decentralized clinical trials into study protocols. We will investigate some of the misconceptions concerning risks in decentralized trials and how to realize value and ROI from implementing these strategies. During this session, please feel free to ask questions by typing them into the Q&A, and the speakers will try to address as many as they can. If your question was not addressed by the end of the webinar, we will follow up with some key answers to the questions. It is my pleasure now to introduce Andrew McKinnon and Chrissy McDonald, who will take it from here. Excellent. Thanks very much, then, Lisa. Um, so, yeah, so my name's Andrew McKinnon. I've um, been working at Medible for the last year and a half, but have a career spanning uh, almost 20 years uh, within clinical research um, across uh, both pharmaceutical uh, and, uh, and CRO companies, uh, mostly uh, focused around delivery of, of clinical trials. So very excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, uh, the new uh, way of doing clinical trials and uh, the, uh, the opportunities available to you there. Uh, Chrissy. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Chrissy McDonald. I'm the Vice President of Client Delivery at the Avoca Group, a life science consulting group. I oversee our Avoca Quality Consortium, our Avoca Innovation Alliance, as well as our consulting research services. So I'll provide some of our research information and leading practice experiences with our consortium today. Sorry about that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so just a little bit about the uh, the, the mission of, of, of our two companies here. So Medible's uh, mission here is, is about bringing research access to everyone uh, everywhere, making clinical development more efficient for customers and modernizing uh, clinical trials with, uh, with flexibility and modularity. Um, and what I love here is, is that the, the, the mission uh, of Medible is, is so closely aligned with what Avoca are doing as well. So Chrissy, do you want to uh, cover that one quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So our mission at Avoca is really to have a positive impact on all clinical trials, really by helping clinical research companies increase quality, ensure compliance, and improve uh, efficiency so that medicines can get to patients faster. And we do that through that collaborative approach with the concept that a rising tide lifts all boats. So we're here to talk about how we can standardize things throughout the industry and utilize all of our experiences to rise that tide. Excellent. So next, we just wanted to get a, a quick polling question uh, out to everybody in the audience here. Um, uh, so what we wanted to know for everybody, just to get an understanding of where your experience is, what your level of understanding is here, um, is across the last 18 months, um, uh, how often you've used decentralized clinical trial elements uh, in your studies. And, and by elements of decentralized clinical trials, what we're meaning here is any of the uh, the elements that make up a DCTT, so whether that's e-consent, um, uh, e-source or eco as e pros, um, remote screening and enrollment, um, televisits, uh, all of these kind of aspects of clinical trials uh, in a decentralized fashion and, and how often you use them. Um, so we'll just give you a, a, a couple of minutes just to, uh, or not a minute, if you can uh, click on the uh, the relevant uh, response, whether you've used that in uh, none of your studies, um, whether you use that in up to 25% of your studies, uh, between 25 and 50%, uh, 50 to 75%, or 75 up to 100% of, of your studies, or if you've not participated in uh, in any or not run any studies in the last 18 months. Um, so it looks like we've got uh, quite a few responses and some still coming in. So we'll just give you a few more seconds um, to get a response in there, and then we'll uh, we'll take a look at the results. Excellent. So it looks like we've got about half of the uh, the audience have submitted a response. So we'll uh, we'll take a look at what the responses are here. So. Um, we can see interesting. It's a it's a fairly broad selection. I'm, I'm 
really excited to see that, uh, that the numbers are greater than 50% are, are fantastic. That, that's, a, that's a really interesting uh, metric to see. And I, I imagine if we'd done this uh, uh, several, several months ago, it may have been a slightly different picture. But that, that's great to see that actually the majority of you are using those in, in over half your studies, uh, which is fantastic. Yes. So, so Chrissy, over to you. Yeah. So I think that that really helped line us up uh, to see a little bit about what the industry looks like as a whole. So the focus for 2020 for the Avoca industry research was actually to gather data just like this. So we were really looking to find out how the events of 2020 may have accelerated operational and study design innovations within clinical development. We were looking to find out how respondents perceived various aspects of clinical trial quality and efficiency to have been impacted by the events. And I'm sure we all know those events are COVID-19, right? And how their organization adapted their management practices accordingly. And whether ultimately there's an expectation that we're going to snap back to this pre-innovation phase or whether we're gonna have an acceleration of innovation past this COVID-19 piece. So in total, we had 229 respondents. There were 145 representing sponsor companies, 84 representing provider companies. Most of the survey respondents representing sponsor companies were those in the top 20 in terms of revenue. So the respondents representing providers worked for a wide variety of um, provider types, but mainly in the CRO space. So it's important just to understand the, the demographic of what we're looking at when we see this data. Overall, in terms of their role within their organization, about half of the respondents represented clinical development or operations groups, and slightly more than a quarter represented quality assurance. And the remainder were a wide spectrum across managerial or other functional roles. Um, but one of the questions that we asked them really was, what were the drivers to the adoption and the effective use of these um, innovations and particularly decentralized clinical trials. So when we asked that, you can see right here, this was the response we got. And so among the respondents whose companies had deployed these decentralized clinical trial activities and really patient engagement type technologies, the primary drivers for doing so were to increase study participant retention and protocol compliance. And then you'll see again, in that list was really out of necessity due to COVID-19 related circumstances. So when you look kind of further at those drivers for adoption and effective use, the necessity for COVID related circumstances is pretty obvious, right? There were quite a few instances where patients weren't able to access the sites for a variety of reasons. Sites were closed because they became um, COVID uh, treatment facilities primarily. Um, some sites closed down for anything that was elective and sometimes their clinical trials fell into that piece. So there was a need to be able to continue with these protocols and getting these patients their treatment um, in a new way, right? And part of that is also to improve protocol compliance. Um, and we wanted people to stay on study. So, when we implement these, it's often the problem statement we're trying to solve is how do we get patients to stay in a study when they are not wanting to come on site weekly, daily, whatever that looks like for their protocol. Um, another thought was really increasing participant diversity. You know, so how do we provide this clinical trial access to patients who are not uh, located close to maybe an academic institution? where they can get access to this or a more rural location. Um, the other drivers were really related to data completeness and accuracy. Uh, we'll see some of that highlighted in some case studies later on. And then also to accelerate those timelines for individual clinical trials. So just a broad variety of all positive drivers there of what people are looking to do when they implement that decentralized clinical trial. But on the flip side of the coin, we actually asked as well, what are some of the challenges that your organizations are seeing or perceived challenges when it comes to decentralized clinical trials? And among all the respondents, including those companies who hadn't deployed innovations yet in decentralized clinical trials, 
The primary challenges associated with the adoption and effective use involved really operational and process integration, followed closely by regulatory challenges or concerns, unclear value propositions, and a wide variety of other things. So if we talk about what that looks like, the operational and process integration piece is going to be something we touch on a lot. There were concerns with how do we make this work with a bunch of different sites using different DCT components? How do we get that involved in our process? Is it simply a plug and play for the technology? Uh, regulatory challenges, as we know, at the start of the pandemic, there were regulatory challenges related to telemedicine and how physicians couldn't uh, practice telemedicine across state boundaries um, and other challenges there with DCT. Um, lack of understanding of the innovation, I think, is really important, and it kind of aligns with what we'll talk about as well later on with how to integrate that technology or the innovation within the process. If you don't understand the innovation itself, it's really hard to picture end-to-end -end how it fits in the overall process. There's also some perceived BCT challenges of unclear value proposition, or how do I justify that there's gonna be a return on investment there. Um, and aligned with that is, is really the startup cost of getting some of these decentralized clinical trial components up and running. And Chrissy, so just- um, Because we're being able yeah. Sorry, just a, just a couple, of, a couple of thoughts from, from, from my side on this one. If you go back to the, the previous slide, I think there's, there, there's a lot of these elements, um, when I think about them and I have conversations with some of the clients that we work with, I think a lot of this is down to the fact that COVID-19 forced such a rapid change across our organization. And it's it's taken a lot of people, not necessarily by surprise, I think a lot of these DCT elements were in progress and in discussion beforehand, but maybe kind of like edge cases, it wasn't the norm. And, and COVID-19 is really throwing this to us and, and forced us to change really quickly. Um, and this is perhaps an industry which is maybe not as quick as changing as, as some other industries. It takes us a little bit of time to get used to, a, to a, 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 an innovation and, and to adopt to it. And I think that is true for some of the technology companies, uh, some of the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, but also the regulatory agencies as well. And, and having everybody move at such a rapid pace, um, it's, it's been a real privilege to, to watch the, the industry change as a whole and to see it pivot so fast. But I think all of these items here, um, when I think back to some of the other kind of big shifts we had in the industry, you know, things like the, the innovation rollout of EDC system, for example, from paper CRFs across to EDC, a lot of these things would have been the kind of challenges we would have seen at that point in time. So I think really it's around um, just change management, and that takes a little bit of time, and we've had to do it at such a rapid pace. Uh, I mean, real breakneck speed here. And so it's, I think this is, it's not something that we should perhaps be concerned with. I think it just fits into that natural change management element. I think you're absolutely right. And what we've heard through the AIA and really the AQC as well is that, you know, these things were happening in pilot projects throughout organizations. What they weren't done is really brought to scale within organizations. And what COVID did was really force us to bring those to scale very, very quickly so that we could get everybody on track and try not to delay these, these patients' treatments that were, you know, in some cases relying on them. So moving on, as, as I said, you know, we're the Avoca Quality Consortium. So obviously something that's really important to us is quality. And we wanted to understand um, you know, from particularly those quality components, what were some of the benefits and what were some of the risks of quality? And so you'll see that we highlighted here really the top three benefits and the top three risks. And we're, this is important because we're going to look at these case studies through the lens of each of these three. So the perceived benefits were, as again, as we talked about, the retention of study participants, the increased diversity of study participants, and ultimately to streamline clinical development. So that was the goal in implementing these and the benefits that they could offer um, to clinical development. In terms of the risks, you'll see again, it's highlighting that the financial resources required, the study participant safety, and ultimately the study participant privacy, which we know is, is closely tied to regulations, particularly those that come out of Europe in how do we do some of these key um, 
decentralized clinical trial components and still comply with GDPR. So what we're going to do is walk through a couple of case studies um, with Andrew's help to really show situations where implementing a decentralized clinical trial, whether completely virtual or just some of those decentralized clinical trial components, um, recognized and realized those benefits that people thought they would see with quality, and also components for those perceived risks were not actually risks at all, and turned out to be benefits of implementing that decentralized clinical trial component. So with that, um, I'm gonna toss it to you to give us our first case study that we can talk through here, Andrew. Excellent, thank you. And just a, a couple of thoughts myself from, from some of those perceived benefits and, and risks. I think, you know, as you mentioned, the, the, the interesting thing is that for each of these, even the, even the item that was you know, retention was seen as the, the most significant uh, benefit to quality, still had a substantial number of people. I think it's 20, over 20% still perceived it as a significant risk. Um, and as you move down through each of these items, um, each one, whilst it was considered maybe more of a benefit or more of a risk, there were still very significant numbers of people, uh, of respondents who considered it to be, um, you know, even these perceived risks were also perceived to be substantial benefits at, at the same time, which I think is, it, it, as we mentioned in the agenda, kind of addressing some of the misconceptions. Um, I think that's a really important part is we all get to grips with decentralized clinical trials and what they can do, and importantly, how best to implement them. I think we'll start to see that actually all of these items can be a benefit as long as you implement it. Uh, as, you, as long as you implement it in, in a correct fashion, um, yeah, I think if you look at some of the some of the, the research that's been done around um, diversity, for, for example, which I know is is a really important um, topic of conversation, particularly with some of the COVID nineteen studies and some of the vaccine uptake pieces and, and the, the, the the results of having maybe a lack of diversity in some of those studies and the implications to vaccine uptake. It'd be very interesting to look at some of those uh, some of those areas. Um, so I think that th this is where we need to look at um, how we take that decentralized element, but how we blend it into our study protocol to get the most out of it. Um, and I think what I scribbled down here, which is really important, um, which kind of highlights that, is it a benefit or is it a risk? I think the most important thing is to find the right partner to develop these protocols and these decentralized trials with, um, but importantly, to find the right components for each trial. Um, this is really a situation where it's not one size fits all. You can't you can't take a kind of cookie cutter approach um, to a DCT and then expect to get better retention and better diversity and quicker timelines. It really uh, that only really happens if you blend that decentralized approach with the protocol and with how you're actually deploying and, and implementing that particular study at sites. Um, otherwise, you know, we run the risk of not getting the ROI that we perhaps expect to get. Um, so I think one of the one of the really exciting things that we can do at, at Medible and we're really excited about doing is, is getting involved in those early stages of protocol design. Uh, and I'll touch on this as we go through some of the case studies as to how we've taken those protocols and, and made sure that we're not just digitizing an existing protocol, but actually we've designed something um, to be performed in a decentralized manner. Uh, and I think that that's a really important aspect of this. This has to start at the very beginning. Um, and as we've seen with you know, the, the, the ICHE6R3 release and that really important focus on quality by design, um, that has to start really early on in the process. Um, otherwise, we, we run the risk of not getting the benefits that we perhaps expect. So to jump into the case studies then, because I, I think th these are these are really interesting areas for us to look at. Um, and uh, as I say, if there are any questions that anybody has um, on these, please do put them into uh, into the chat box uh, on the system here. If there's anything else you want to to know or understand about uh, about these case studies. Um, so this first case study I want to talk about um, is in age related macular degeneration, um, and I think that in itself is quite an interesting point um, to pick up on. Uh, often we'll get asked the question, you know, is it possible to do decentralized trials with uh, great levels of technology in more elderly populations? Uh, and this is an example where we've taken, by definition, a more elderly population and run a very successful uh, decentralized uh, approach. Um, and, uh, and so I think that, you know, really that there isn't, a, there isn't really a case study we, or a, a situation we've seen yet where, where a decentralized approach cannot be, cannot be implemented. So this particular case study, as I said, was in uh, age-related macular degeneration, but was in a very specific 
uh, subset of a very rare genetic variant uh, of patients for this. Um, this genetic variant was present in, I think it was just under 2% of, of the population uh, of, of AMD patients. Um, and so the company were looking to enroll uh, about 1,000 patients into a study with this particular genetic variant. Um, and to get that, what they were looking at was having to screen about 11,000 patients to identify that, uh, that particular population with the rare genetic variant. Now, to do that in a traditional um, manner, um, actually for this company was just not possible. It couldn't be done. It was too lengthy. It was too expensive, too time consuming. Um, and so the study had been delayed for a long period of time. Um, and we were able to, to work with them and look at how could we do this in a decentralized approach. And so what we did here was to implement a complete remote screening process, so 100% remote screening um, using a, a genetic screening kit and an e-consent approach. So <clears throat> patients were recruited um, and enrolled into the study through things like social media campaigns, uh, patient advocacy groups, all these kind of aspects. Um, the patients were consented uh, remotely. Uh, they were shipped a genetic test. Uh, it was a, a cheek swab, a buckle swab, um, uh, that went back to a laboratory. Um, this study was uh, focused in the US only. Um, the, the genetic test went uh, back for testing and the patients with that rare genetic variant were identified um, so that only those patients that have passed already that most challenging of, of eligibility criteria are then presented to the site. Uh, and those from that point on the study proceed in, in a more traditional on-site kind of brick and mortar approach. Um, <clears throat> the other area that we were able to look at with this with the company was to, to look at actually once we've identified those patients with that variant, how do we make sure that the site they then go to is set up near to them? So rather than setting up, these are my 100 sites and everyone has to go to whichever is the closest, we identified the patients, then we identified the site to make sure that we only stood up the sites that were near to those particular patients. So some really fantastic outcomes from this. Even with the, the, the remote approach, the expectation was that enrollment would take two years. Um, actually was done in one year, so half the time. <clears throat> there was an expectation of about 100 sites in a traditional approach. Using this kind of uh, identification of sites near to patients, we were able to limit that to only 25 sites. Um, and the expectation or the, 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 the kind of the, the estimation here was that the total cost of this trial was reduced by about 40% <clears throat> from the original uh, cost estimate of about 50 million. So some, some really nice outcomes uh, here from taking a decentralized approach. Um, but again, it's the fact that it was the right decentralized approach for this particular protocol and this particular patient population that means you get those very successful outcomes. So Andrew, just to follow up on that, um, my assumption is because you were setting up sites sort of after the patient was identified that it was a central IRB that was utilized in the process um, for the initial sort of consenting and then you utilize the sites use that same central IRB to sort of keep it moving? I, yes, I believe that was the case. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks. Excellent. So that's, that's our first case study. We'll, uh, we'll pop into the second case study. So this one um, <clears throat> is a focus very much on, on remote uh, patient monitoring. So what we're looking at here is, is improving the retention of, of study participants. That's very much a focus of this case study. Um, importantly, also with this one, we're actually looking at how we addressed what was perceived in the Avoca survey as a potential risk um, to quality from taking a decentralized approach. And, and actually, you'll see from this case study um, how we actually significantly improved um, patient safety, uh, participant safety for, from this decentralized approach. Um, and then just a quick comment on, on privacy. I don't want to go into too much detail because it's quite a, a dry uh, topic um, to, to talk about. But really, all of the, the case studies we have here address participant privacy really by virtue of the fact that that is largely addressed um, through the, the, the construct of the, the platform, the architecture and the security that, that exists there. So it's an important part for us to, to look at. It is something that is um, a, a very important topic, both for, for, for kind of ethics and regulators, as, as well as the, the participants in the study themselves. Um, so it, it, it's an important part, but really it's to do with the, the underlying architecture of the system and, and how it makes compliant with all of the regulations. 
So just to uh, to jump into this um, particular uh, study here. So this is, as I say, really all around remote patient monitoring and, and how that was implemented to, to improve uh, patient safety. So the desire here, the need from the sponsor was to look at how they could detect instances of a pulmonary adverse event uh, much earlier um, uh, or much more uh, timely to when that event actually started. Um, now, this uh, particular uh, product had, had gone through some uh, traditional studies, uh, and in that traditional kind of on-site approach, um, we had uh, pulse ox um, uh, measurements um, and adverse event collection done during the on-site visits. Uh, so during the initial dose escalation phase, those were done weekly. Uh, and then as the patient moved uh, through the study and moved into the follow-up stage, those visits became less frequent and became monthly and became quarterly. So the difficulty here was if you're only taking that SpO2 measurement um, on a weekly, monthly or quarterly basis, that's really your data point to identify that adverse event. Um, and so you're becoming more and more sparse in your measurements and less able to detect that event happening. So with a decentralized approach, um, and this is an, an important way of looking at how do you how do you decentralize the trial to maximize the benefit of, of that approach? You could have just taken a decentralized approach, given the patient uh, a remote Bluetooth connected uh, pulse ox um, device and have them measure them, measure that pulse ox weekly, monthly and quarterly. And you would get zero benefit. It's not going to get you any further um, to, or any better situation to be able to identify those events. But because that's a really minimal burden to a patient, it's a Bluetooth device. It clips onto a finger. It automatically transmits uh, the reading to the uh, the application on the patient's phone and makes that uh, reading immediately available to the site um, and to, uh, to the study team. So what we're able to do here is to implement throughout the life of the study a daily uh, measurement um, of that. And then if there's any uh, drop in that figure, if there are any um, uh, issues that are potentially picked up, we're able to trigger additional uh, adverse event collection uh, questionnaires to go to that particular participant. Um, and all of that information can be presented back to the site. They're able to look at it, see if the patient needs some additional interventions uh, and to put those interventions into place. So really what we're looking at here is getting a much uh, quicker identification of a potential problem Ideally, a quicker intervention to prevent that from becoming more problematic for the participant and retaining them in the study, uh, but importantly, really m mitigating risk to the participant um, and, and showing how we're able to do that, um, uh, do that in a much in a much earlier fashion. I think that that's really interesting, and I I think this is a, a really key highlight where we showed that there was some oftentimes a lack of understanding of innovation, right? And we keep talking about it from sort of quality by design components, but this just very clearly highlights that if you're looking to just digitize and capture that time point like you would if the patient were in the clinic, you're gonna miss out on that benefit of being able to capture that potential adverse event significantly earlier and in fact, increase patient safety. So it's really interesting because I think when you, you first look at this, the thought is to just say, okay, well, I need to get a pull socks on this day without thinking that it's more than that, right? You want to collect the pull socks forever and make sure that it, it's never problematic. So that's really interesting. There's a couple of questions from the audience here, Andrew. Um, one of them was asking specifically about issues with cell phone connectivity in relationship to this um, example. And then there's a couple about um, some of the previous examples too, but let's start with this one first. So cell phone connection, um, not something that we've that we've seen so far. Um, typically in the studies that we work on, um, we are using a, a BYOD or bring your own device approach. So we allow the participants um, in the studies to use their own device as long as it's um, of the the right kind of uh, the right the right level. Obviously, nobody in here with Motorola flip phones from the, from the eighties, but. Uh, 
um, as long as they've got the right level of smartphone, they're able to, to maintain that um, and then use all of the, you know, that, 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 um, that, that cell connectivity there. Um, we can also uh, provision phones um, uh, to participants if necessary with the right kind of cellular and Wi-Fi connectivity um, to, to, to allow for that. Um, now, I haven't heard of any particular issues with, um, with that. Uh, obviously, in, in this kind of situation where you've got uh, the patient having to do uh, a pulse ox at home uh, at some point during the day, they're able to utilize likely their Wi-Fi connection, um, which is, is going to be the, the best way of doing this. But the, the data requirements for these kind of um, data transmissions is incredibly minimal. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very small amount of data necessary. We're not looking at transmissions of you know, multiple megabytes or gigabytes of information that, that's going to cause problems with a cellular connection. Um, so no, it, it's not something that we've seen before. Um, but we have uh, on occasion also looked to, uh, to provision um, kind of Wi-Fi dongles or you know, uh, those kind of things as well. If there isn't a suitable connection, um, look at ways of, of, of expanding that. That's excellent. There's one more sort of follow-up question to that, just asking if this was a US-based only study and if you had similar experience ex-US. So I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is a global study this is uh, running in in multiple countries um, and uh, we've not seen any issues with uh, with the the uptake of this in a, in, a, in a broad global basis I think that there are some countries where um, there are some specific data localization requirements um, where this could be a, a little trickier uh, but uh, no this is um, this is global impl global implementation um, uh, and I, I did notice actually there was a, a question um, I'm just trying to find how I can get it back because it's uh, it was one that I thought was quite useful. So I'm just trying to uh, scroll through this. So yeah, there was a question here around training given to the patient in order to ensure the data collection was was accurate. Um, and I think that that is a really important aspect um, of, of of a decentralized trial. As we start to push more um, uh, more requirements uh, for the patient or participants to to do data collection. Uh, exercises, whether it's things like uh, pros or whether it's things like a connected sensor uh, measuring here, what we have to make sure we are very careful is we're not just pushing burden down the chain. Um, and so one of the elements here um, was that the, the device itself was a very, very simple connection. As I say, it's a Bluetooth connection. It takes, I think it's about 15, 20 seconds um, to, to connect. So it's an incredibly simple process. Um, but alongside this, there's a couple of, a couple of elements that we would um, uh, normally look to, to implement. So we have uh, within the applications that we, uh, that we develop, we have a, a resources tab. Um, and within that resources tab, we're able to post a lot of the training guides, uh, user guides uh, to guide a patient through those particular steps. Um, and we can even do things like dropping videos into that as well. So you're able to show exactly how to do that step uh, in a video as, as well as in, a, in a, a written format as well. So it's really important when you've got such important measurements here that you take account of um, what is the burden to the patient for doing this particular process? Uh, how can we make sure that it's as simple a process as possible? Deciding on a device that has the best user-friendly um, interfaces, the best user-friendly setup processes, all of these kind of things are really important elements to consider um, really early on in, in, the, in that process to make sure that the end result is as, is as quality as possible. That's excellent. I think we covered most of the questions surrounding this mm -hmm. case study. There's one from the first one. I think we can pop back to at the end. Um, okay. I think that's great. So we can maybe jump into the final case study that we were uh, we were going to talk through. So this is um, and we, we often get asked, you know, kind of what, what is what is a, a decentralized clinical trial? And, and I think in, in some people's minds, um, what I'm about to talk through here is, is kind of a, what a decentralized clinical trial is. Um, and I think most of what we've been talking about so far are, are kind of what we would refer to as hybrid decentralized trials, where you have a blend of on-site activities and a blend of, of, of remote or decentralized uh, activities within, within the protocol. So these two previous case studies have been what I would refer to as a hybrid. Um, this case study here is then 
one of the, the fully decentralized uh, studies. Um, so this was really looking at, again, retention of, of study participants. Um, and that that's uh, just a, a quick comment on retention, because I think it's, it's a really important um, uh, aspect of why decentralized trials work so well um, for retention of study participants. Um, there was a survey done um, to show that uh, there was a, the average study dropout um, was around 30%. When you consider across all the studies that we undertake, the average dropout rate for participants is about 30%. Um, and then there was another study that was looked at um, that showed the average travel time to a, um, to a clinical research site for a participant, and this was in an oncology setting, the average travel time was about 25 miles. And for every 30 miles you increased beyond that, uh, retention uh, dropped by about 10%. Um, so doing things in a remote fashion and enabling patients uh, to, to carry out activities from their home uh, and bringing the study to them rather than bringing them to the study um, has such an important impact on, on retention. Um, so I think it is, it is certainly, as you can see here, one of the major benefits that was perceived from a decentralized approach. And I think it is a really important aspect of, of how to look at minimizing burden on, on participants to increase that retention. Um, so, yeah, so this case study here is looking at um, uh, the retention of study participants, um, how you drive a uh, greater level of diversity, um, streamlining clinical development, um, and again, obviously, uh, the participant privacy as well. So this particular study um, was conducted in a rare disease patient population. Um, and the sponsor was looking here to, uh, to screen and enroll a thousand participants into this particular trial. Now, obviously, with this being a rare disease study, um, and I'm sure everybody on the, uh, on the call has, has, uh, has conducted these studies in the past, typically they require a huge number of sites, and typically for not an awful lot of participants in a particular study, and so that the costs of that become uh, very significant very quickly. So, what this particular sponsor wanted to do was to conduct this uh, this study with a thousand participants, um, uh, but to do it in a completely fully decentralized approach. So in this particular study, there is no um, kind of on-site face-to-face <clears throat> -face contact uh, with the PI. There's in fact only one single PI across all uh, thousand participants. Um, all of the aspects of this study are direct to patient. Um, and we're able to use the application to capture uh, key disease status information. We randomize the patients um, into two different uh, arms for, for blood draws. <clears throat> um, and then we're able to, to implement a remote uh, adverse event follow-up and reporting process here to, to make sure that we are compliant with all the regulations. So again, patients recruited here through, uh, through email, uh, through social media, through advocacy groups. Um, in a very typical kind of a remote uh, enrollment process. Um, patients that are interested are then uh, sent a consent form and an enrollment questionnaire. And based on the responses they give, we're able to confirm eligibility with an automated uh, check um, and randomize those patients that, that come into the study. And then uh, those patients are then required to have a series of blood draws at different intervals. Um, all of the materials for those uh, blood draws are sent directly to the patient. Um, and then the patient books a visit at a patient service center. <clears throat> so I'm sure those of you in the US are probably quite familiar um, with this concept of uh, using, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, using patient service centers to, to facilitate the, these blood draw events. Um, and then we're able to take the date of the blood draw, use that to present a questionnaire to the patient <clears throat> in a very contem contemporaneous manner to that blood draw, so we collect the data at the right time. Um, and then we follow the patient up over the course of the study uh, with various EPROs. Um, and then should any uh, contact between the PI and the patient be required, um, then we have the televisit function in there. So any questions from the patients, <clears throat> any requirements to report adverse events, uh, all of these kind of uh, all these kind of aspects can be handled through a televisit approach. Um, so we saw a number of uh, of, of significant um, uh, benefits here. We we enrolled um, just over seventy five rare disease patients within the first three weeks of the study. Uh, so very quick update. Uh, we're able to manage that. Um, as you say, one single PI enrolling that number of patients in a short space of time would be very difficult without this kind of automated workflows and making sure that the burden is handled by the technology uh, rather than, than by, the, uh, by the site uh, and the site staff there. 
So some very interesting um, approaches here. I think this this kind of fully decentralized approach, <clears throat> removing sites, um, works really well in these kind of studies. It's maybe not the approach to take for a lot of protocols. Um, there's a number of key considerations to make with this kind of approach, but this kind of fully decentralized um, uh, uh, so in this kind of uh, situation worked, worked very efficiently. Andrew, there's lots of questions in here in terms of the investigational medicinal product. There's a couple people who have asked um, and acknowledged the sponsor's sort of uh, risk-averse nature to just taking the patient's word for it, that they, you know, took the correct amount of IP um, or post themselves correctly. How was that handled across some of these studies? So this particular study, <clears throat> the fully decentralized the third case study, was actually, uh, it didn't involve an IMP. So this was uh, looking at um, a couple of other aspects of the disease through blood draws. Uh, so this wasn't a study that involved IMP. Um, so what we were sending direct to the patient were all of the, the necessary elements for the, the, the blood draw, uh, the, the labels, the right packaging, that kind of thing. Um, so this, this was a, a non uh, on IMP study here. Um, I think for the other um, uh, for the other studies where we look at things like direct patient shipment, um, there's a number of ways of, of looking at this. And I think what we shouldn't do is is kind of overcomplicate things and expect the technology to take on more than we would do in a tra in, tra in a traditional approach. Um, you know, I think if we have a patient who visits a site and they're given a bottle of 30 pills and instructed to take one a day, uh, and they bring an empty bottle back, we take it that they've completed that uh, that task and, and done one a day. We do that accountability. Um, there are certain situations where maybe a, a more robust and rigorous approach, and you can do things like you know, Bluetooth connected pill bottles that you know, measure, you monitor when the bottle is open, pills are taken out. So there are additional opportunities to look at a more robust assessment of, of drug compliance. Um, but as I said, I think we need to be careful about expecting the technology to do too much and go too far beyond what we would do uh, previously. I think that's very helpful. And again, if you're doing a study that is of a hybrid nature, then you have that opportunity to to have that you know more frequent maybe contact during those those phases. I can see a question about um, you know the IMP during dose escalation. Um, that was really something that was managed on site uh, with more frequent on site visits. And then as the patient began you know, was off dosing and being followed up and was doing less frequent visits, that's more able to move into a, a more remote. Um, management uh, aspect of, of, of the study. And I think that's, again, really where looking at that kind of quality by design approach for a protocol and how, how I take the technology and the decentralized elements and put them in the protocol at the right point in time, um, I think is a really important part of that design process. Andrew, when this, um, you know, fully virtual trial went to an IRB for approval, did, was there anything different in terms of expectations or questions that came back from the IRB for these fully virtual trials, or did it feel business as usual in terms of submission and approval, you know, six, eight weeks later or whatever? This this was a very straightforward approval process. This one came through very quickly. Um, we'd, we'd had a lot of discussion about, um, you know, making sure that the right kind of um, data and the right kind of explanation was present around the technology and the system and how it worked, um, all of those kind of aspects. Um, but no, this this was a very straightforward um, ethics uh, uh, approval. I think I've, you know, there's a couple of questions I've seen coming through about, um, you know, do, do we do we see problems with with ethics committees and, and regulators on these kinds of studies from a, from a study approval perspective? And I think our experience so far is that as as long as you present the right information to the ethics committee, really the same kind of process as we would for, for any um, submission. As long as an explanation of how you're managing privacy and security, exactly what the application is doing, um, you know, how the, the decentralized elements are built into the protocol and that is all explained. Um, then so far our experience ethics committees have been very, um, uh, very uh, happy to approve these kind of approaches. Um, we've seen some questions come back, but nothing really from my experience um, that was kind of out of, out of the ordinary. In, in terms of that as well, looking less from the regulatory perspective and maybe the IRB perspective, but what about the patient perspective? We know that for some patients, um, 
they want to be home and some want to be in a clinic and seeing it. Are you seeing sponsors um, utilize a hybrid approach to hybrid trials in that they're yeah. <laughs> allowing that flexibility, if you will, for the patients to go in and physically see a PI if they want, or they can do it from their phone? Yeah, definitely. We, we've we've seen uh, a number of a number of studies where there's been uh, an option for the for the participant to select uh, whether they want to do um, a visit on site or whether they want to do it maybe through a tele visit uh, or through a home health nurse, uh, something like that. Obviously, that's not going to work um, if you've got a study with a MRI requirement at visit two. That's going to have to be done on site um, until someone invents a portable MRI machine. Um, but uh, you know. <laughs> There, there are, there are, as you say, that there are certain participants that would like to have the face-to-face -face contact, um, and there are some that would prefer to, to do it in a remote fashion um, to kind of fit around their lives. So again, I think taking that kind of making that optionality available within the system, uh, making making sure that the patients are able to um, to you know say that I want to do this visit by this method, this this visit by this method, um, and having that flexibility, I think, is an important part of making sure that. Patient satisfaction from these trials is really high, so that you you get things like the, the improved retention, the improved compliance, um, that are definite benefits from a DCD approach as long as it's done properly. I think it goes back to you know the point of this whole discussion today, and in, in the quality by design concept, right? So you need to build in these technologies, but you also need to have uh, an understanding of your patient type and what is going to be more desirable for them. Um, I know my parents aren't the greatest at technology and they would probably rather drive in the car than to try to figure out how to work an iPhone. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think looking at sort of the disease burden um, across mm -hmm. your patient type and, and thinking about that proactively as well is going to be important to realize, as you said, the benefits that are there for, for these trials. Yeah, absolutely. So, There's one other question just about the AMD trial or case study that you had shown, and it was just asking um, really about the endpoints that were captured and were the endpoints there related to um, uh, primary endpoints or any safety endpoints for the trial that were be being captured in that decentralized piece? Sure. So interesting, actually, for, for that AMD study, the, the element that was done in a decentralized approach was really that remote screening piece. So once we'd identified the patients that had that rare genetic variant and you've, um, you've removed that particular part of the burden, because I, you know, I've, I've worked on studies like this in the past and very quickly sites become fatigued with screening after screening after screening and never getting a positive um, back. So once we'd identified those patients that had that genetic variant, everything from that point on was done in a more traditional on-site fashion. So all of the, the, the study efficacy and safety endpoints were captured in, in a more routine on-site fashion. Um, but it was really just the, the, this, the, the key problem for this study was how to do that screening of 11,000 11, patients to identify the eligible patients. Um, once, you've, uh, once we'd overcome that particular problem, from that point onwards, it was a study that suited well for, a, for an on-site um, approach. Uh, and so, for, as I say, from, from that enrollment point forward, um, it was a traditional study. It's really interesting. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. So we talked about what Avoca found in terms of perceptions for their risks and benefits. Um, how do they align with what you experience with your clients? When people come and they're talking to Medible about implementing some sort of DCT component, what are their biggest concerns or as you're sort of talking through their their potential trial with them, what do you feel like you're always trying to kind of calm their nerves about? I think all of the items that you've identified are exactly what we would the kind of conversations that we're having around that. So, you know, how do I how do I increase retention? How do I increase diversity? These are you know, really key important factors. Um, in how I'm deploying clinical studies uh, from this point forward. So how do I achieve that with, with decentralized studies? So absolutely all of those items. And then you know, on the flip side, uh, some of the, um, the, the risks that you've got in there around you. Know, how do I make, 
how do I make sure that I am getting the right level of compliance and that I'm not you know, minimizing patient safety by doing everything on a tele visit? So the, these are all the kind of concerns um, uh, I think that, uh, that that we see on a, on, a, on a regular basis from the clients that we work with, the conversations that we have. Um, and I think really the answer to this, is, as I said at the beginning, is that kind of that protocol fit approach. Um, you know, looking at the protocol, looking at the the, the outcomes. What are you looking to collect? Uh, what are the particular problems with that particular patient population, maybe with enrollment, maybe with compliance, maybe with retention, um, and then addressing those specific issues and deploying decentralized um, elements to, to fit that particular piece. So you're not throwing the kind of the, the decentralized kitchen sink at a protocol. Uh, you're just picking the right elements that, that work and that warrant the investment um, and will return the value because that's, the other part, and I think that was one thing that you picked up as well, is, you know, kind of what is the, what is my, I'm worried about, you know, this increasing the cost of my study and what, what am I getting back as, as the value? And I think the important thing there, again, with that kind of protocol fit approach, deploying the elements that you need, not spending money on the elements that you don't need, um, is going to make sure that the cost is appropriate. But I think the important factor is to consider the value. So, if you spend, um, if the cost of deploying the study is a little more because of the additional technology, but actually it means that I can reduce, I can reduce the enrollment period by a year. Um, I can get to my endpoints and understand the, the results of the trial, um, you know, a year earlier than I would have done otherwise. The value of that is huge, uh, and I think that's really where it's important to to consider kind of the cost and the value, and to look at what is the return on that investment from from deploying something in a decentralized approach. Yeah, that's some of the work we're doing with the Avoca Innovation Alliance is uh, prioritization, if you will, of decentralized clinical trial components, because some of the fear that we hear from uh, clinical operations innovation teams is that the path forward is going to still be full of this momentum, but it's going to be, let's just use all of these things without, as you said, really evaluating which ones are going to provide the most value and which are you know, an add-on just for the sake of, of adding it on, right? So trying to sort of move the traditional approach of innovation that we've seen in the industry where it's sort of this broad, you brought up EDC, right? It's sort of this, the whole industry or the whole organization starts using EDC, whereas these decentralized clinical trial components, the whole organization may start using it, but it's not every piece of it, making sure that it's fit for purpose and how do you, how do you help study teams who are perhaps naive in the use of these DCTs really think through the value that they can have, right? And it's, yeah. it's working through, I think, all of these, hearing case studies from Medible, hearing case studies from sponsor organizations who are willing to share so that we can have this industry-wide lessons learned um, so that people can sort of step into the unknown with a little more understanding and expectations of how these things can provide value for them. So it's really, Absolutely. it's really great to see these. Absolutely. I think the, the as I said, you know, making sure that this is discussed early on in that protocol design phase, I think is, is really important. Um, you know, trying to kind of shoehorn technology in once your protocol visit schedule is, uh, is, is outlined and all the different assessments are done, it's not going to be as, as successful. But I think, as you say, understanding kind of all the different roles, um, uh, the different elements of a company will play within a decentralized approach, I think is, uh, is, is a really important factor to consider, as you say. This has been really great. We have about five minutes left. Um, I'm not seeing too many questions left. Um, for those that aren't answered, we can try to answer them offline and distribute them with the um, the recording uh, and the slides afterwards. But just some of the key takeaways for today, um, really that the perceived risks that we identified of decentralization um, are often misconceptions. So we just sort of highlighted it a little bit. But I think the more that we can share these through the different collaboratives that are out there through webinars like this and be able to share our experiences. We, we shared good experiences today. Like these were case studies that really highlighted when it works. But I think sometimes it's even important to share when it didn't work 
so that we can learn that as an organization or as an organization, as an industry, um, and not do the same mistakes over and over again, like we frequently see in other sort of risk management things throughout our industry, because ultimately the only people that, um, you know, really lose in those situations are the patients, right? So making sure that we can continue the open dialogue about these things to really change those perceived risks to being risks of protocol design, but not necessarily risks of using the technology there. Um, and again, you know, I'm grateful to Andrew for being able to highlight um, for us, for the AQC, we're doing uh, a presentation on the industry research in the middle of June. So it's really nice to be able to present these as risks, but also be able to highlight case studies in which that they're actually benefits so that they're not deterrents. The last thing we want to do is say, here's a risk of decentralized clinical trial. And people leave thinking that that's, that's fact, right? And I think what we did here today was to highlight the fact that, you know, that's not fact and that we can address that through through different means of, of planning. Absolutely. Uh, Andrew, and I, I think, yeah, the, the, yeah the, so the, I think the case studies that we presented here show that, you know, you, you can make decentralized solutions and, and deploy them in a way that creates a lot of value. And quite often that value can be, um, uh, put into trials that, that traditionally, or I say traditionally, we've not been here that long, um, perceived as kind of a poor fit for a decentralized um, approach. And I think it's where that final take home here, that quality by design technique, um, making sure that that technology is closely weaved into the protocol design, um, really should mean that there, there are very few studies that are not a fit for some element of decentralization to look to reduce the burden to, to sites uh, and importantly participate, uh, participants in, in studies. Um, so I think that it's, it's really important that part to, to look at the early design element um, of a study, consider the, the problems you're looking to solve and get the right DCT solution uh, in amongst that uh, to, to fix that particular problem. Um, so yeah, I think that's it's a it, that's to me is a very important takeaway for um, for everybody here. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you for partnering on us or partnering with this. Um, we have had a wonderful time. Thank all of you who attended today, and I think we will send some follow up information for the materials if you'd like to share it with your colleagues. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for your participation today. And uh, Chrissy, thank you for, uh, for everything you've contributed um, and for carrying out the survey. I think it's, uh, it's been fascinating to see the results of that. So thank you as well. Not a problem. There's some information here if you'd like to learn more about either Medible or the Avoca group. And we will talk to you again next time. Excellent. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody.